Welcome everyone to Spirit of Truth Church for this sermon on Matthew 8, 28 through 34. And now let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, we praise your name. God, we would ask for your help in all things. Lord, we acknowledge your sovereignty. We choose to honor you, and we choose to praise you for who you are. Thank you, Lord, for your salvation, which you have brought to us through Jesus Christ's death on the cross. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit to guide us. Lord, we praise your name. In your name we pray. Amen. And now let's move to the reading of the scripture. Matthew 8, 28 through 34. When he had come to the other side, to the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him as they came out of the tombs. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. Suddenly they shouted, What do you have to do with us, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now, a long way off from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. If you drive us out, the demons begged him, send us into the herd of pigs. Go, he told them. So when they had come out, they entered the pigs. And suddenly the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the water. Then the men who tended them fled. They went into the city and reported everything, especially what had happened to those who were demon-possessed. At that, the whole town went out to meet Jesus. When they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. Now, I'd like to argue the main idea of these verses is as follows. In these verses, Jesus demonstrates his authority in the kingdom of God as he commands the demons to cease their activity and flee to the pigs leading to death. The reaction of the town shows that unless one receives Jesus spiritually and is born again, demonstrations of power, miracles, and authority will have no salvific outcome. And now let's move to the exegetical portion of the sermon. So let's talk briefly about the synoptic differences. In other words, the differences in the story between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So in all of these, Matthew's version is the shortest. And what we find between the three accounts is that one writer had details uh, that others did not have. It's possible they had different emphases. And when you look at all of the accounts, you tend to get a more complete picture. For example, one account has only one man, another account has two men. Uh, one account is the country of the Gadarenes versus the country of the Gerasenes. And again, I think this more arises from the variant readings in the Greek manuscripts. Gadara actually is more likely uh, as it is on the Sea of Galilee. That's most assuredly where it is. Now, jumping into verse 28, we see that they meet Jesus on the road. So what's happening? Well, they're essentially controlling travel along the path. So they are being disrupted. They're being disrupted to travel and trade. And in M Mark and Luke, it actually talks about how they broke free of their chains and shackles. And in Mark, you even see a little bit of how their, the anguish of the men is portrayed. Um, they clearly aren't enjoying being demon-possessed. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of issues going on in here. And so what we see here is the power of the demons is displayed in physical capabilities. Now, someone questioned, well, what can demons do? Well, it's very clear that at least in this scenario, they have the capability to supernaturally strengthen people. In other words, make them very, very strong. And we kind of learn from these that the whole region is sort of terrorized by this legion of demons that's controlling them. Again, if they're controlling travel, this is going to be a major impediment uh, that these demons are essentially enforcing in that region. Now, in verse 29, we see the demonized men saw Jesus coming and they recognized his power. They ran down before him and begged him for mercy. In other words, they were afraid of him. They knew the power. They knew the authority. They knew who he was. They knew from whom he was sent and they knew that they had no way of even laying a finger on Jesus. There was nothing they could do to harm him at all. They couldn't stop him from going. They couldn't do anything. In fact, what they were afraid of was the judgment. So again, there was no attempt to harm him. They knew who he was. He was the Son of God, the Son of the Most High God. This is a recognition of his divine authority. And the fear was that the kingdom had come. Because the demons know that when the kingdom comes, they will be judged and put down. Their time on this earth will be over. There's an appointed day for their permanent removal and their eternal punishment. And again, the demons were unaware of a split in the coming of the Messiah. They thought, oh, once he comes for once, then that's it. But there, was a, there, was, there are two comings of the Messiah, 
and they weren't aware of this. And they tormented people, but they begged not to be tormented themselves. So it's funny, they, they exhibited power and cruelty, but they were also cowards. It's very fascinating right, that you get this, this shows of force and cruelty, and then the second that it's turned on them, they become cowardly, and they, they, they want mercy, right? But it's very key that they did not know that the second coming was going to happen in terms of a second. They thought, oh, this is it. The Messiah is here. The time is over. Now, in verses 30 through 34, we see that Jesus grants their request to indwell the herd of pigs. And here's the interesting thing about this. This region is mostly Gentile. So the presence of pigs shouldn't necessarily be thought of as inconsistent with Mosaic prohibition of pigs. Um, I've run into commentaries on both sides, equal amounts from trusted sources, some saying that, yes, it was a judgment against Jewish people keeping these pigs, some saying that that's an illegitimate teaching. So I'm not, because there is such disagreement, I'm simply not going to teach it in the sermon. Um, so I would say the reason for the request to go into the pigs can only be speculated, but why did God permit it? Well, again, it's a powerful demonstration of his power over demonic forces, their fear of him, and also the ignorance and stubbornness of the human heart. One of the freed men, we learned, wanted to actually become a disciple. And this could, by the way, be the reason for the focus on just one man in one of the Gospels. And Jesus essentially sends him home to be a witness of his power and mercy. Now, when the demons are sent to the sea, that is actually very important to the story. The sea is associated with demonic imprisonment. So people essentially would have assumed, when they saw the demons go into the herd of pigs and go over the cliff and die, that the demons were essentially being sent into the ocean or the abyss where they would be kept and deactivated from the region. And so that's actually a positive thing. But then we have to jump into the response of the people, and this is where it gets really odd. The response of the people, again, primarily Gentiles. Their business is destroyed. No question about that. Thousands of pigs, their business is destroyed. They just lost their livelihood. And so they tell him to leave. And there's actually no record in the Gospels of Jesus ever going back to that region. And so right here we see this fascinating scenario where he set these people free from the demonic torment. It cost some people their livelihoods and businesses. And rather than thank him in any way, shape, or form for, for getting rid of the demonic issue, they tell him to leave. They'd rather have their business and the demonic stuff, then lose that business, have to start over from something from scratch, but be free of demonic possession. And there's some things we're going to talk about there in the application about that issue. So now let's talk about some of the exposition. So what is the reality of demonic possession? Well, they are cruel and they torture humanity. And I think it's very important that we see this. There is no such thing as demons possessing someone and it's a happy-go-lucky fun time. Unfortunately, we see in the modern day with New Age and with Hinduism and some of these other things that people essentially invite demons into themselves. They invite the, the concert of demons. They invite speech with demons. We see this even in some New Age Christianity where people are speaking to spirits and, and quote, angels that actually are saying things against scripture. Thus, they must be demons in disguise. And so we see a lot of this stuff. And the reality is it's always cruelty and torture. They may promise good things, but they do that in order to get in. They do that to get a foot in the door. But once they have the foot in the door, their cruelty and torture becomes first and foremost in the lives of these people. Additionally, you see a relief upon being freed. They may have initially wanted the demons. They may have done something to invite them in or whatever, but there's a relief upon being freed of the demonic forces. This is not a fun situation to be in. Now, what about the response to the Gentiles? So again, the threat was to their business. And here's a, here's a fascinating little look at this. There's a fear of a greater power. You see, the demons were sequestered to an extent, right? The demons were in these people, they were on the road, they were harassing people, yes, but if you stayed away from them, they kind of stayed away from you. It's when you tried to use the road that it became a problem. Um, you know, I mean, they probably did other things too and, and harassed people, they were afraid of them to an extent, but the point is they were, they were contained to an area. Jesus' power is not contained to an area. Jesus demonstrated such a, a powerful authority over those demons that this was essentially something unprecedented, and it's, it's sort of clear that the people didn't want to repent of whatever it was. They didn't want Jesus. I, I think it's safe to assume they were happy in their sins, whatever they may have been. And they didn't attack Jesus or anything because, again, they saw his power. But they wanted him to leave. In other words, they preferred demonic presence 
over the presence of the Almighty God. And I think that goes to show you their spiritual condition. And beyond that, we have to really take a look then when we start to examine modern day instances of this, whether they be in New Age Christianity, Hinduism, spirituality, religion, however you want to put it, that people are much more willing to entreat spirits, in quote, quote angels. I say angels because I think they're really demons in most cases. Then they are entreating the one true God. And that's a serious issue, and we see this present here. Their spiritual condition is being spiritually dead. When you are more willing to entreat demons than God, you are in a spiritually dead condition. Now, what about the Christocentric setting? Well, we see the authority of Christ very present in these verses, especially over demonic activity, but also over judgment. It's interesting that the demons were not omnipresent or omni uh, omniscient. They didn't have all knowledge. They knew that Christ was going to come. They knew the Son of God was going to come and judge. In other words, they're kind of aware of their own fate. But they didn't know how. They didn't know what was exactly going to go on. They, they were ignorant, even though, theoretically, they could have seen the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures were there. They were ignorant of a lot of things about what God had actually said. They were ignorant of God's word. And as a result, they think, oh, he's come to judge us now. And so we see this. We see that when Jesus comes as judge, people were ignoring him on the earth in the first coming, but the demons knew. They flat out knew. It's like, no, 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 the judge has come. He's here. There's no escaping this. And so even when we are getting into this whole idea of Christ coming the second coming to judge, it's going to be similar. Rather than just the demons acknowledging it, it's going to be all people. This is where every knee shall bow. The bottom line is when the judge comes the second time, everyone's going to have to bow the knee. There's not going to be an impossibility of rebellion or rejection at that point. It's you bend the knee and you're sent either to the kingdom or to hell. We also see the Son of God, Messiah, and the divine status coming out here. You know, they call him the Son of God, and that's not just a, a minor thing. That's speaking to his eternality. In other words, they knew of him before he was born. They knew who this was. The demons recognize this. They've known this for a long time. And yet the people refuse to recognize it. The demons see it clearly because they, they are seeing things from a sense, a spiritual perspective, not a positively spiritual perspective, but they're seeing it from their perspective as spirits and as having existed for a very long time. But the people refuse to see it. They are spiritually dead. They refuse to see who Jesus actually is. We now have to ask ourselves in terms of application, what does Jesus have authority over? He has authority over your job. He has authority over your family. He has authority over your region. He has authority over everything that goes on under the sun. He's got the authority of it. And it's fascinating because when he says demons have to go, they simply have to go. When he says your job is going to change, your job is simply going to change. Jesus has ultimate authority. Now, what could have happened there is people could have said, well, I simply am going to trust in God. I'm simply going to trust in God that he is going to provide. Even though he just wiped out all these pigs, wiped out livelihood, I'm going to trust his bride. In fact, they could have asked him. They could have said, Jesus, you, you literally just killed all our pigs. Okay, you are the sovereign Lord, um, but what do we do now? And interestingly enough, I think had they done that, my thought is, is Jesus' response. If that was a sincere thing, he would have probably said, you know, thank you for trusting me and not just telling me to go. I think that would have probably been said. And then I think he would have provided them with something, somehow. But they didn't respond that way, and so they were not provided. It's, so again, a very fascinating type of, of situation. And I think that actually does apply to today. We always have the opportunity to walk in God's will. And we have an opportunity to rely and ask on his provision where we think and believe he is calling us to go. Whether it be missionaries or pastors or even in our regular jobs or whatever it may be, we always have the, the ability to rely on him. This is, again, the Lord's, uh, Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. He's promised a provision. We can rely on him for that provision, and they could have here, but they didn't. Now, the second thing I want to talk about is this issue of, of uh, demons, and specifically, again, how we, we are interacting with demons in the modern day. So the problem is this. Demons are deceptive. Demons are deceptive. They will sometimes use try and, try and twist Scripture against us. They will sometimes... Uh, possess people. They will sometimes try to have influence. They will look positive or look good uh, in their approach to people, so people get in with them. Um, you Again, I think they're in Christian circles. I think they're in New Age circles. I think they're in Hindu circles. I think they're everywhere in, in that sense. And what we have to do is we have to be people of the book. We have to be people of the Word. 
it's very possible. God, there are still angels. It's very possible God sends angels to do things. But we should not be going to angels for divine revelation. That's the providence of God alone. We should not be going to angels for spiritual advice or wisdom. Uh, that is illegal. That is essentially divination. That is attempting to contact someone other than God for things. And really, if in terms of divine revelation, God should be the one contacting you, not the other way around at this juncture. And so instead, people are walking away from the Word of God. They're walking away from the Bible, and they're walking toward these New Age methods of worship and experience. And it's very dangerous because they're being deceived by demons without realizing it most of the time. Uh, often in the secular realm, they talk about good spirits and bad spirits, and the reality is there are no good spirits and bad spirits. They're all bad. It's just how much do these things want to toy with you and how violent and cruel are they going to be versus are they just happy keeping you away from Jesus, which, again, comes to the same solution, you're going to hell. This is a serious problem. And so if we don't recognize the supremacy of the Word of God in all of this, we're going to have a serious issue where we're not going to be able to see this stuff when it's there and call it out when we have to and protect ourselves against it. Because again, they thought, oh, we can just let these demons exist here and that's fine. The true God comes up, shows, kicks them all out, and they tell them to take a hike. Now, there are some situations going on right now where people believe that they're seeing angels and things like that or believe this, and, and they may. I'm not saying angels don't exist. They, they do exist, and they do help us at times. But it's very clear from the messages that these are demonic beings. And so we have to recognize that Jesus has the authority over this stuff, and that this stuff in Jesus' name can be cast out and dealt with. And we should not entreat these spirits, nor should we have anything to do with them or any of the activities that come from them. And so here we are. We have a decision to make. We can choose to engage in things that come from demons, like the Enneagram and yoga, or we can choose to reject those things. We can choose to engage in things like trying to hear from the spiritual realm, or we can say, no, that's demonic, or that fundamentally leads to demonic stuff. These are the types of things that are attacking the Christian church today. They're the types of things trying to find a home in the church, and we shouldn't allow that. And so in conclusion, I would like to say this. Jesus has all authority over heaven and earth. This includes the demonic realm. In the final judgment, all demonic activity will cease for all time, and the eternal state will usher in an eternity of peace for the people of God. And now let's close the word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, that you have power over the demonic realm, that you can simply speak and it's eliminated. Thank you, Lord, and we ask that we would allow that we be, would be allowed by your Spirit to receive you and to reject evil. Lord, we need more of you, less of ourselves, and less of evil in the world. Lord, please fix our eyes firmly on you and your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us here at Spirit of Truth Church. I hope you have a wonderful day.